Cheers. <laughs> the thing about Blanc Mange is that would keep me from eating too much is not the texture, but the almond. There's, you know, there's yeah. only so much almond you need. Yeah, no, it, it kind of fills you up. Yeah. yeah. That's a stiff drink there, Chris. <laughs> I, I'm realizing this now. We're then, gonna... Chris, we need to drive. <laughs> we have to get all the way across yeah. the country, buddy, <laughs> <laughs> on one bottle of rum. They had oh. gas. Okay, caskets. Um, caskets of rum. Caskets. Well, all right, well then, <laughs> pour away. <laughs> Actually, uh, okay. Chris is doing there. some damage control there. I'm Chris Denson, and the other voice you heard was my co-producer, Deep Thee Murley. And this is Consolation Prize, a podcast about the United States and the world through the eyes of its consuls. Consolation Prize has looked at the lives and careers of American consuls as they encountered far-off lands and foreign cultures. In this bonus episode, we are going to zoom in and take a closer look at the ways these consuls participated in different cultures and how they forged the relationships that fostered diplomacy. That's right, today... We're talking about food. Food has been central across time and has served a variety of functions. Beyond the task of sustaining daily life, food has been found at the heart of religious and community rituals. Additionally, food has solidified the boundaries between rich and poor, saved and damned, the powerful and the wanting. In other words, Food has served as the means of illustrating who belongs in a certain group and who does not. Although I didn't realize it at the time, food and drink have been present in all of the stories we have told in Season 1. In Jerusalem, it was a marker of civilization. In Martinique and Canton, it was the backbone and draw of imperial power. And in places like Algeria and Zanzibar, it was the distinction that upheld class and authority. So in this bonus episode, we'll go back and take a look at some of our previous stories with a more hungry eye in order to see how central food was to the cultures American consuls found themselves in. Just as a reminder, all of Season 1 of Consolation Prize is up and available at consolationprize.rrchnm.org if you want to learn more about the American consuls that we will reference in this episode. Before we get started, we need to set up two big ideas that will help structure this episode's stories. First, food helps to determine belonging, meaning it shows who is and who isn't a part of the community. For consuls, food was very connected to their sense of home. As our colleague Megan Brett reminded us, James Murray, the consul to Liverpool, got Virginia hams from his family back in Virginia, even though the cuisine of the United Kingdom wasn't all that different from Mari's usual diet. In a sense, even though he was far away, home was brought to him through ham. Our second big idea is that food has historically been tied to empire. This means that food has served to reinforce who has power and who does not. We see this at work in our episode on Sila Merrill, the consul to Jerusalem. In that episode, the question of how food was produced showed who had political power. From Merrill's American standpoint, the local ways of farming and agriculture were simply not up to snuff with the vast production networks of the supposedly civilized West. As a result, the agricultural schools Americans set up and consuls helped to keep alive helped propel this notion of civilization. The schools were tangible signs of of a foreign power's presence in these local communities. It turns out that food and methods of making food could be effective means of imposing authority, shaping the relationships that consuls and Americans had with locals across the globe. 
With these big ideas in place, it's important to keep in mind that food works very differently for those who dwell on society's margins as opposed to those at the centers of power. We are going to address each of these experiences in two episodes, so be on the lookout for that follow-up episode that will shift our perspective to look at food from the bottom up. But now, let's dig in, pun intended, to see how these larger themes played out around the world. As many of the consuls in Season 1 realized, food often came up in relation to religion. Whether it was the American interaction with the Jewish population in Jerusalem or Consul Mohammed Russell Webb's conversion to Islam, food often stood out in the form of halal and kosher laws. These laws dictated what members of a religious community could and could not eat and drink. Such laws were so important and pervasive that special cookbooks began to be compiled in order to cater to religious communities. They provided alternatives to Muslims and Jews in the United States and around the world. Food laws helped solidify communal boundaries even as they made some relationships and interactions more difficult in an increasingly connected and commercial world. Take Richard Waters' first interaction with local representatives in Zanzibar as another example. In what he thought was a show of hospitality after welcoming these local merchants aboard his ship, Waters offered them wine which they promptly refused because they were Muslim. In that first moment, it was driven home to Waters that he was the outsider in this community, and his traditional notions of food and drink did not apply. Waters had to learn to navigate these different worlds if he hoped to be a successful consul. Yet, learning to navigate through different traditions could be incredibly complex. Not only did Waters have to take into consideration different religious traditions, but also how various empires had affected local communities. Honestly, it looks good. I cooked this for two and a half hours. And so it kind of falls off the bones. And then you take the bones out and then shred it. The dish Boko Boko, which Deepthi made for our team, is a good example of the interplay of these different dynamics. The dish itself has Middle Eastern origins and was eaten in contemporary Zanzibar where Waters served as consul in the mid-19th century. In Eastern Africa, the dish continues to be known by the name Haris, hearkening back to its Arabic origins that indicate centuries of commerce and colonial relations between the Middle East and the Swahili coast. As a dish, Boko Boko represents a mix of cultural and culinary practices that combined Arab, Indian, and African influences. At the same time, Boko Boko also incorporated dietary laws in that the meat the dish calls for is only lamb, beef, or chicken, since pork was expressly forbidden. As we will see later on in Martinique as well, Consuls were constantly entering into worlds whose shape had been forming long before the U.S. decided to open a consulate. Boko Boko also represents another aspect of 19th century food culture. Like many other dishes and meals in this era, Boko Boko was an incredibly social object in both the amount of time it took to make and the large portions it typically provided. It is a dish that was made for eating at large gatherings as a social activity in the community. What else is in it besides? It's meat? wheat. Okay. It's wheat. This is the soaked wheat. Yeah, it's the soaked wheat, beef, uh, cumin, cinnamon, salt, and pepper. So it's almost like vulgar. Got yeah. that same sort of, I wouldn't say nuttiness. I mean, that's kind of what I associate with. Yeah, the, like what I'm nuttiness. looking at here. Yeah. Like, very similar to that. It's, sort it's, of, it smells a lot like yeah. sort of a beef and barley stew. Ooh. It's good. That is not bad. Yeah, like I would eat right. this. Yeah. I would eat this. That's what I'm saying. probably yeah. have more. I know. <laughs> I mean, it really does taste like a beef and barley soup or something mm-hmm. with yeah. slightly different spices than I would yeah. normally put into yeah. it. How all the things that we've made, like most of the things, maybe not the blanc manche, but like whether it's tea, coffee, the the bread, 
it's for like social eating mm -hmm. and it's for large scale eating mm -hmm. right um yeah and 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 then everything is as the smell like this bread it's yeah the fennel like you can smell the fennel yeah they're very the smell is nice um when we made the brewed the tea mm. Lincoln had gone out for lunch and then he said he could smell it outside <laughs> in the corridor <laughs> that's awesome because that thing I was mean that in. is pretty pungent I was yeah. very that, very sniffy very pungent yes yeah, so. more yes please thank you I'm going to ask him Many other food and drink items were made to foster a community's social life. Turkish coffee, for instance, was made for a very different setting than the modern coffee stores that channels more of a quick and individual drive-through mentality. Deepthi explained it best as we were sharing a cup of Turkish coffee from my local coffee house. <laughs> isn't that isn't that really um, interesting though that you can't slug this coffee; you have to sip. But that's what I've been doing just because my American way of drinking coffee yeah. is just like so. So down. that sipping means you have to taste it and you have to slow down. Right. There is no way to drink this coffee fast, mm -hmm. unlike you know your local Starbucks. Right. That you can just sort of or Dunkin' is basically yeah. water. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> so I, I'm sort of imagining how this could. This is so so much about the sociality of the drink, right? Like yeah. you have to sip. You have mm -hmm. to sit with the person who's like you know sitting. If you are sitting alone, you have time to introspect, and you know it's 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 a process. Yes. Rather than what we do now. Right. Yet coffee in the 19th century represented more than just sociality. In places like Algeria, it was the ritual that upheld the power dynamics at play in the courts of local rulers. In episode 9, we looked at the careers of James Leander Cathcart and Richard O'Brien as consuls to the Barbary states, including Algeria. Much of that story came from the personal memoir of James Cathcart, as he described his time in captivity and his experience in the court of the day of Algiers. Coffee was not only a central feature in court life, but a ritual that reinforced the local power hierarchies and upheld Algeria's class structure. In order for any foreign pe person to negotiate with the day, he first had to be willing to drink coffee with the day. Deepthi and I talked more about the implications of this ritual after trying our first sips of Turkish coffee. Cheers. Ready? Cheers. It's interesting. So it's, that's really good. I mean, I like the spicy overtones and it's, it is dark and bitter, which normally for someone who says he doesn't like a dark roast, now I'm really... I, I don't like the dark roast at places like Starbucks, yeah. right? Because it is incredibly bitter. Yeah. But this, I don't know if it's just the spices or the beans are better, but... I was going to ask, so the consuls um, were in um, Algiers. Mm -hmm. Would they be having the black bread with this? Or? No. no. So we it's two different levels between the black bread and the coffee yeah. in that story. The black bread is what is rationed to them twice a day as mm -hmm. slaves, right? The coffee is very much the day, the day's thing, and it's the way of almost showing his benevolence to slaves and to foreign ministers. Ah. Um, he had it's called it was a called a coffee ish. Mm -hmm. It's his his officer of yeah. the coffee house Office. and the coffee beans, yeah. right? And so it would be different ceremonies where, like, the higher up slave, I mean, like a calf car, um, yeah. Who do a good job, or who are who kind of get in the good graces at the end of the day? Like it's the way the day shows his like congratulations. He brings, and that's why I think you were right. The whole yeah. experience is yeah. so important, is because it was a show of benevolence yeah. and and sus, I guess of way like I sustain you kind of a thing. So here's a gift. But then what was really I thought it was so fascinating was then for four like consuls. So it's Cathcart who comes back yes. in the day as a, as the consul, yeah. right? And then even for foreign ministers, he in his as he's reminiscing about his time as a slave, talking about all of the different ministers that come to the day of Algiers, and that the most common kind of ritual of how that meeting first goes is that he has his coffee, give the minister a cup of coffee, he drinks it all, and then fills the empty cup with coins or with oh. gold and gives it back to the day and then the day takes that and it goes in the treasury and then at the end of the year he takes part of that treasury and gives it to some of the slaves oh. so it's like it's it's this it's this whole ceremony yeah thing around yeah. coffee coffee yeah <laughs> 
The power dynamics at play around food were not always local. The American experience in Jerusalem suggests that food could serve as a tempting force that invited representatives of foreign powers to intervene and civilize the local cuisine. As we saw on the island of Martinique and the ports of Canton, food and drink drew various empires of the 19th century to certain parts of the world. In season one, it was things like sugar and tea that drew France, Britain, and the United States to a string of islands in the western Atlantic and to the waters of southeast China in order to stock the kitchens and bakeries of far-off metropolises. Deep Thee and I sat down with God's Will Kachua and Lincoln Mullen to share some tea and dessert and talk more about the changing foodways in the context of 19th century empires. So... We have Lapsang Suchong, which is one of the highest Antilles. We have Bohi, which is made out of Lapsang Suchong and was the more famous and more available in the U.S. in the 18th century. Mm-hmm. And then we have the like middle Orange Pico. Yeah, orange it's, Pico. it's also like Lapsang Suchong, but mm-hmm. it's the different tea from a different part of the Fujian province. Right. And we're pulling mainly from Samuel Shaw's episode, yes. Consul of Canton. Yes. So which one of these teas would he be more familiar with? The Bohi? He'd be familiar with all three, but Bohi is probably the one that Samuel Shaw was bringing back to gotcha. the U.S. You, you gave us the excerpt from one of his journals in the 1790s, 1780s, mm-hmm. about him very concerned about yeah. Americans having whatever access they want to tea anytime they want it first impressions of this tea that you none of you know what it is, right? So, so we have not been prompted in any way. Um, <laughs> my my guess is that this is the bohi. Okay. Because, Why? Because it has a little bit of a smoky flavor, uh, smoky flavor and smell, but not as much as the lapsong suchong. Mm. Okay. Guess. Okay. It's hard to, to tell how it transitions from smell to taste. Right, that's what I was thinking. I was going to guess the lap song, but you're right, the smell is definitely more potent than what I'm tasting. I also, I don't know, maybe this is the first time I'm having a smoky tea, but it's like the sensation of if you ever walked into a barbecue restaurant and somehow made that essence into tea form, that's what I'm getting. I don't think I would have thought to do that, but here we are. Yeah. um, Godswell, which one? Which one do you think is I'm going for, I've not had smoky kind of tea before, so... (laughs) <laughs> this is a new experience. <laughs> so if I'm, a, if I'm to guess, I'll totally be wrong. <laughs> Second tea. Second round. With the tasting of the third and final tea, we all revised our guesses. Well, this one smells and tastes decidedly <coughs> less smoky. So I'm going to guess orange pico. Okay. So Lincoln guesses orange pico. I'm going to guess that this is the Bowie Okay. Tea. We think God's will. Is this the orange one or is this a lesser of the smoky one? I think it's less of the smoky, smoky one. one. And, uh, okay. So, so now you want us to tell you what we would order if we went to a colonial cafe? Uh, yes. yes. Remember it's 18th century. Am I a man of wealth and means or am I a day laborer and very cheap? <laughs> <laughs> Let's say you're a man of wealth. Let's give you all the options. I, I would go with the lapse of Yeah. And that is why it was so expensive. <laughs> <laughs> because, God's will, what would you prefer um, if you were in 18th century and buying tea? Which of the three would you... I think I would go for the orange. The orange pico? Yes. That is, that was also a wealthy man's tea, by the way, because it didn't, it was entirely different, like a different kind of a taste. Mm-hmm. After we had finished with the tea, we moved on to talk about the growing importance of sugar by trying the 19th century French dessert Blancmange, along with the French drink Tea Punch, which just so happens to be the national cocktail of Martinique. But this was, this is taken from French Martinique with the idea that in the 19th century is when Blancmange used to be a meat dish. Oh. Until the, from the medieval, this is what I uncovered, until the 19th century when sugar kind of takes off throughout the empire, it becomes exclusively like a very post-meal dessert entertainment kind of feature. What does it taste like? 
Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sugar. Mm-hmm. Is it rice? Is that the yeah. Mm-hmm. Feels like very. Tastes like close. Tastes like a cookie. Something yeah. Like a vanilla. Yeah. Exactly. Cookie. Yeah. Yeah. Like a coconutty. So it's actually almond. Like, it tastes like the dough. Of, I think if you like rice pudding, you would like this. Yeah, no. mm-hmm. Not exactly a similar texture, but it's in the ballpark. Yeah. You know what this reminds me of? Marzipan. Have you had marzipan? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's right. Yeah. yeah, like a marzipan. Yeah, cookie. yeah, yeah, like a marzipan cookie. Like the, yeah, that that nuttiness. A cross between a marzipan cookie and a rice pudding. pudding. Right. Yes, exactly. Yeah. I think the mm-hmm. thing about blanc mange is that would keep me from eating too much is not the texture, but the almond. Just you know, yeah. only so much almond you need. Okay, so this tea punch they drank. They. It with the blanc mange in Martinique. Right, another French kind of dessert drink. Yes. Um, this one is from? Uh, Martinique is the Eden to Ashes. Eden right? to Ashes. Right, so that was yes. episode eight. So this is actually, we focus on that episode mainly, and that's the consul who was killed in the explosion of, is it Mount Pele? Yeah, Mount Pele. Mount Pele. Yeah. Pele. But then we finished that episode talking about how it, the United States had by the end of the 19th century is beginning to find itself increasingly within the imperial competition for the West Indies and the Caribbean yeah. and how sugar has become the staple crop of that. So this drink and the Blanc Mange is you is kind of speaking to to the heightened place of sugar in that because this this is, is primarily based sugary sugar. stuff. Our discussion of cuisine, consumption, and consoles in this episode highlights the crucial role that food played in building networks of commerce, power, and empire. But what is less visible is the connection of some of these same food products to systems of enslavement, alienation, and oppression. For example, hidden behind the nutty sweetness of Blancmange is the history of Martinique's sugar plantations, which were introduced in the 17th century. Between 1635 and 1789, 700,000 Africans were enslaved and brought to Martinique, Guadalupe, and Saint-Domingue to cultivate sugar plantations. After the abolition of slavery in 1848 in the British Empire, plantation owners shifted to using indentured laborers from India and China, perpetuating the exploitative means of agricultural production. The history of this sweet dessert is tied to the unsavory history of sugar production in Martinique. Behind almost every dish or cup of coffee lurked power relationships that reinforced individual, communal, religious, and cultural boundaries. As was the case in Martinique, food could have a darker side when it came to the question of who was to produce the ingredients that made the French desserts and sweetened their cocktails and the English's tea. A very different food world existed when viewed from the bottom up. In the next episode, we will explore some of these lesser-known foods and people the consuls encountered. Consolation Prize is a podcast of the Roy Rosenzweig Center for History and New Media at George Mason University. This episode was produced by Chris Stenson and Deep Dee Murley. Special thanks to our executive producer, Abby Mullen, and team member, Megan Brett, for production assistance and partaking in our food tasting. Thanks also to Lincoln Mullen and Godswell Quechua for joining our taste testing. Music for this episode is by Andrew Coding. This episode was recorded partly on location at Washington, D.C.'s Municipal Fish Market and the Crepes and Carrick Cafe in Vienna, Virginia.